turn your Bible once again to the book of First uh, or Second Corinthians, chapter four. Okay, Second Corinthians, chapter four. While you're turning there, I wanted to mention that you know, chapter three that we looked at the last time we opened this uh, book together. Chapter three and chapter four are um, are obviously connected. And chapter 3 begins to tell us the major difference between the time period that is called the Old Covenant. When we talk about the Old Covenant, we're talking about the law that God gave to Israel through Moses. The big difference between the Old Covenant versus the New Covenant, when we talk about the New Covenant, we're talking about a covenant that God promised that he would give Israel to replace the Old Covenant and that new covenant was ratified, or you might say inaugurated, by the death of the Messiah, Jesus, on that tree. Okay, so the new covenant at least has, has been established by the blood of Jesus. The nation of Israel have not yet uh, enjoyed that covenant because they have not, of course, acknowledged Messiah Jesus. But that's coming. That's coming in the future. But in Jeremiah 31, I wanted to share this with you. So you see that there is a big difference as even prophesied between the old and the new covenant. Here's what Jeremiah the prophet says. He said, the days will come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. So he's saying, I'm going to make a new covenant, and it's not going to be like the old one. It's going to be different. Well, one of the greatest explanations of the difference between the old covenant, we might call it the Old Testament, and also the new covenant, the, the, one of the greatest explanations of the difference is 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Chapter 3 tells us that the new covenant, that new covenant living, could I call it that, living under the new covenant, it packs a overwhelming, more glorious power than the old covenant really for this reason. The covenant under Moses, all it could provide was a code to live by that was carved in stone. Whereas the new covenant that I said was ratified by the death and shed blood of Jesus, that produces the very life of Jesus with that potential of him living his life through new covenant believers. So it's overwhelmingly more glorious than the law of Moses, the old covenant, as it's called. It's a totally new way that uh, is pictured in chapter three by, remember Moses, when he got those 10 commandments, when he got that old covenant, on Mount Sinai, he comes down, and what's what about his face? His face is glowing, right? His face is shining because it's reflecting the fact that he had been in the glorious presence of God for over a month. So that face of Moses that glowed is fading, and that is a picture of the glory of the old covenant under Moses, how that it is fading away, and that is compared in the closing uh, verses of chapter 3 to the dazzling, bright, transfigured Christ. Remember when Christ was on that Mount of Transfiguration? Remember the three disciples that were with him? They were scared to death. You know why? Because it wasn't just his face that glowed. It was his whole body that glowed, and it was shining as bright as the sun through his clothing. 
It was a dazzling brightness when Christ was transfigured and it revealed the glory of Jesus, who is really the initiator and the ratifier of the new covenant. So the new covenant is much more glorious. And that's what it says in the closing verses of uh, 2 Corinthians 3. It says that that dazzling brightness of the transfigured Christ, you ready for this? Is revealed in the life of new covenant believers as they allow that to happen. That is, your life as a believer should reflect and radiate the glory of the transfigured Jesus that lives in you. That glorious Christ that appeared on Mount Transfiguration, that glorious Christ lives in you through his spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. And so there is that brightness and and he lives in you to draw many others to himself. And to do so, he points out in chapter 4 how that happens. And so this is great because chapter 3, it really ends with the fact you have the transfigured Christ in you. And guess what he's doing? He's transfiguring you as you allow him to do that. And he does that so that he can draw many other people to himself that they too might be transfigured by him. And there are ways in which this happens that chapter 4 is all about. And so I want to pause a moment and pray and then share some thoughts with you from chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians. Father, thank you. Thank you that we're together this morning. Thank you that we have your, your word, our Bible. We pray that uh, you just use it. Oh, God, we understand that, as Paul said in the third chapter, we're insufficient for this ministry. Our sufficiency is of you. And so we, we recognize that, we acknowledge it, we depend upon you, and we pray that you will communicate the truth that you want to people to hear today, that you would get glory to yourself because you are the living, glorious Christ that we want to point to, that we want to love and know and have live in us. So Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for what you're going to do now in Jesus' name. Amen. There are two things that I want you to see in the fourth chapter. I'm try, I try to make it as simple as possible, and yet this truth is just, it's, it's just overwhelming to me. Two things. Number one, I want you to see the power of New Covenant or New Testament ministry living. I'm going to call it ministry living because if you are a Christian, if you live the Christian life, you are living a life of ministry. So I'm just combining it and I'm calling it ministry living, all right? So two things that explain New Covenant ministry living. Number one, power. That's what the first two verse, uh, first 12 verses are about. And then the second thing is perspective, which is the rest of the chapter, verses 13 to 18. So I'm giving you the main outline. First 12 verses, new covenant ministry living involves power, and it involves perspective. And you'll see what I mean as we go through this. There are two ways that uh, God gives power to... to Live for him and serve him. And in the first six verses, the first way in which we live powerful ministry lives is through openness. Look at how he puts it there. He says, because we have this new ministry, because we have this new covenant ministry, as we've received mercy, we don't quit. We don't faint. We're not discouraged. But what we have done is, verse 2, we've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Now, remember in, in chapter 3, he was talking about uh, the truth of God being hidden behind a veil. He used the, the veil of Moses as a picture of how 
God's truth gets hidden. He says, but we've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, in deceitfulness, not handling the word of God, the Bible deceitfully, but rather revealing the truth and commending ourselves, being transparent ourselves, revealing ourselves, commending ourselves to every man's conscience before God or in the sight of God. Then he goes on to say this, but if there is any hiding, if there is any veiling of the truth going on, if our gospel be hid, the people to whom it is hid from are, are called here the lost. If you don't know Jesus as your personal savior, and I'm not talking about knowing about Jesus. I'm not talking about uh, believing that Jesus is the son of God and that he died on the cross and rose again. I'm talking about if you don't have a personal relationship with him where you have stopped depending upon yourself and your good works and you have totally transferred your dependence on Jesus alone, you're lost. You're in that category called the lost. And that's why you're lost. The gospel is veiled to you. It's hidden to you. How? Look at verse four. The God of this world. Now, the God of this world is an evil being. The God of this world is his name. We call him the devil. We call him Satan. The God of this world is the one that is behind this hiddenness. This veiling of the truth of the gospel. If our gospel is hid, it's hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world has blinded or veiled the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of, you might say, the transfigured Christ, who is the image of God, who is God in human flesh, should shine unto them. So, openness. He says in verse five, that's why we don't preach ourselves. We don't preach ourselves. That wouldn't do any good. We preach Christ Jesus as God, as the Lord. We preach him as God, and we present ourselves simply as your servants for Jesus' sake. And then he says in verse six, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Remember that in Genesis 1? God said, let there be light, and there was light. He, this same God, hath shined in our hearts, that is the hearts not of lost people, but in people that were previously lost, but now are saved, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of, you might say again, the transfigured Christ. What am I saying? I'm saying the power for new covenant ministry living begins with this kind of openness. Have you ever feel have you ever felt like you wanted to give up? I mean, as a believer, have you felt at times like you wanted to give up because of perhaps opposition or affliction that you have suffered or are suffering? Paul says in verse 1, we don't give up. We don't faint. Why? Because we have a new way of ministry living. We have this openness. New covenant ministry living provides us encouragement. Great boldness. Great confidence is what he's saying. But you know why? Because if you connect it with chapter 3, it's because we have transfigured lives. Paul says in that 18th verse of chapter 3, he said that as we cooperate with God, as we cooperate with the indwelling Christ, and as we depend upon him, you know what happens? He is in the process of transfiguring us to become more and more and more like Jesus, the transfigured Christ. And because of that, we have boldness, we have confidence, and we have nothing to hide. We have nothing to veil, to cover over. It's all out in the open. 
he says in verse 2, we don't have to resort to distorting the message of the Bible. We don't have to veil or hide the message of the scripture. We don't have to play tricks on people. We, we simply tell them what the Bible says, and the Bible has power because of its transparency and then us being open before you. So any veil, any hidden message from the Bible, any inability to understand the truth of the Bible, trace it back to verse 4. Satan's behind it. Satan's behind it. He says in verse 3, if our gospel's hid or veiled, it's hid to lost people. And it's because Satan has veiled or blinded the minds of lost people. You know why lost people remain lost and refuse to believe the gospel? It's because, and you need to understand this, there is a supernatural power called Satan that veils their understanding so that human intelligence isn't sufficient to grasp the gospel. There is a supernatural blindness that Satan puts upon the human mind so you can't see. It's like the blind leading the blind. Now, I, I know Satan's, he, he, he's, he, he believes in God. By the way, Satan's not an atheist. Atheists take it way past the one that they follow. Satan's not an atheist. The demons believe in God and even tremble, but uh, he's deceived in many other ways. He's blind. Satan's blind in many other ways. He thinks he can replace God. He's thought that for however long it has been since he rebelled. So it's the blind leading the blind here, so to speak. And what it's saying in verses 3 and 4 is people that are not saved, that are lost, they cannot see that Christ is God. You know people like that. Maybe you were like that at one time. Their minds are blinded. You know, the, the, the Muslims, they don't believe that Christ is God. They believe he's a prophet. Why? Because the God of this world has blinded their minds. Orthodox Judaism do not believe that Jesus the Messiah is God. Why? Their minds are blinded. There's a veil over their heart. I understand that there's judicial judgment from God involved in this, but Satan, he kicks in his part too. I understand that. So when you're giving the gospel, what Paul says in verse 5 is, you better focus on Jesus and not on yourself. You better focus on Christ. You better focus on his glory, his glorious presence. You better get out of the way for the Holy Spirit so that he can reveal Jesus. That's what verse 5 says. We don't preach ourselves. We preach Christ. And then he says in that sixth verse, and I love this, talking about the power that comes through openness, spiritual openness. He says in verse 6, the creator of physical light, God said, in the beginning, let there be light, and there was light. The creator of physical light, guess what? He's not only the creator of physical light, he himself is spiritual light. And I believe he is physical light too. Because did you know there's no day or night in heaven? You know why? Because God is the light. He is the physical light as well as the spiritual light. So the God that creates uh, light in the beginning, on the first day of creation, is the spiritual light. Who's writing this letter? Who's the human writer of the book of 2 Corinthians? It's Paul. He had a personal experience with that light from heaven on what is called the Damascus Road. Paul was struck down and blinded by the glorious light of the transfigured Christ. He saw the same transfigured Christ 
that those three disciples saw on that mountain. And so he's speaking from personal experience. He said that same God of creation, he has shined himself, his light, into our hearts to give the light, verse 6, of the knowledge of the glory, the transfigured glory of God in the face of Jesus. He saw Christ in his glory. The glorious transfigured Christ shines in the human soul, and that glow penetrates that satanic veil over the mind, over the heart, and it radiates then through your body life. What he's talking about is when people get saved, they are enlightened. They are illuminated supernaturally by the Spirit of God. There is a, they become, you might say, part of a new age, part of, a, of an age of enlightenment. That is God's new age. Not Satan's new age, but God's new age, God's enlightenment, divine enlightenment. The powerful brightness of Jesus is put in you when you're saved. You know why? So that then his brightness can shine through you. How does that happen? New covenant ministry living is powerful. And the power is in two parts, openness, but also when we look at verses 7 to 12, it requires weakness. Isn't that, again, the paradox of the Christian life? Weakness. And that's what he begins to say in verse 7. We have this treasure. What treasure? What he just talked about in verse 6. We have this wonderful treasure of the transfigured Christ having shown in our heart, taken up residence in us, in all of his glory, to reflect and radiate through our bodies, through our body life. But how does that happen? We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Can I give you a different translation of earthen vessels? Fragile pots. Fragile clay pots. In fact, I have entitled this message, Tremendous Treasure in Plain Pots. The treasure is Christ in you. In a fragile clay pot called a human body, called a human being. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Why? so that the excellency of the power may be seen to be of God and not of us. We're just fragile clay pots. <laughs> We're not the treasure. He is the treasure in the, these fragile plain pots, you might say. You know, vessels, he calls them earthen vessels, clay pots. Vessels, they are made and they are formed to be containers of something. But in this passage, we are called clay pots, and we are not to made to contain something but someone. And that someone is Jesus. We have this amazing, inestimable treasure stored in fragile clay jars. It has nothing to do with your intelligence quotient. It has nothing to do with how smart you are. It does not, uh, it's not about your giftedness and your abilities. It has nothing to do with your personality, whether you're dull or charismatic in your personality. We're all just fragile clay jars, basically, because it's not about the jar. It's not about the pot. It's about what's contained, the content of that pot, of that jar. And such glorious power doesn't mean that because we have this in us, this priceless treasure in us, that our life is going to be easy. 
that our life is going to be uh, is going to be protected from difficulty or from affliction or suffering. If you have that mentality, you've misunderstood what being a Christian involves. In fact, he's going to tell us here, beginning in verse eight, he's going to tell us. By the way, I should say this: I remember uh, years and years ago when the treasures of King Tut were on display around the United States of America. Maybe some of you got to uh, actually see that on display. Well, I'm sure if you stood in line and and actually got to see some of the treasures of King Tut, uh, it wasn't dis on display in a shoebox. It was probably in a, in a very secure and beautiful uh, uh, container in order to protect it because of its value and, uh, and so forth. And yet we have this treasure in fragile clay jars. The fact of the matter is, if you are a believer, you are fragile. You might think you're not. You know, did you know that uh, just uh, breathing the wrong kind of air or being bit by a, a, a very small uh, bug could kill you? We think that we are sometimes immortal, but we're not. In fact, Paul tells us, even as believers, beginning in verse 8 and uh, down to verse 9, he says, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, not destroyed. Let me uh, retranslate that for you in this way. We're pressed on every side by troubles, but we're not crushed. We are perplexed, but we're not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but we're never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we're not destroyed. What's he telling us? He's telling us that we are going to face a battering and a shattering. These clay jars, these plain pots that contain such priceless treasure are going to be shattered. You can expect it. You're going to suffer and understand your weakness because regardless of your intellect, regardless of your giftedness, regardless of your personality, it's not about the jar, it's about the treasure and it is a way, the shattering and battering is a way for God to reveal his power that it's not you, it's him. Just after Hitler's terrible uh, regime and Hitler was done and gone, two years later, in the Qumran area of Israel, a couple of shepherd boys, that Bedouin shepherd boys were playing around, and one of them threw a, a stone through the opening of a small cave. And when he did, he heard something shatter. And when he and his friend, uh, out of curiosity, climbed into the opening of that cave, they found clay jars, plain pots. But the one that was shattered had ancient manuscripts in it. There are four caves that, that were finally investigated, and they found in, in those caves what are known today as the, as the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls are very valuable to anyone that has an interest in the Bible. One of the major things that have come out of the deciphering of the Dead Sea Scrolls is just a confirmation of the reliability of our Bible. For here are the earliest records that we have in our possession of Scripture. And it matches completely and perfectly with the scriptures that we have translated in our Bibles. 
so we can have confidence in the Bible. But these priceless manuscripts that have meant so much to the biblical world are on a bunch of old clay pots, treasure in clay pots. We're just clay pots, but we have the treasure of God himself in us. Because it's not about the jar, it's about the contents of the jar. And that's what verses 8 and 9 are telling us. It's not an easy life. In fact, let me tell you this. New Testament Christian living, New Testament ministry life, it requires a certain kind of mindset. Are you ready for this? If you don't have this mindset, don't ever sign up. It's the mindset that Paul talks about in Acts chapter 20 and, 24, uh, and verse 24. He says, I count not my life dear unto myself. Jesus said it in different words. He said, uh, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. He that uh, saves his life will lose it. But he that loses his life or, or surrenders his life to me is going to save it. And that's what he's talking about here. This is the kind of mindset that we need. A total surrendered, a willing commitment to be completely spent in living to bless other people with God's truth, with God's life. We share the glory, but that requires that we also share his death, his crucifixion. That is a death to our self-life, a death to our selfishness, a death to a self-life. Look at what it's going to do. Verses 10 through 12. Always bearing about in the body the dying, the death, the crucifixion of Jesus. Why? In order that the life of Jesus might be revealed, might be manifest, might appear in our clay jars, in our bodies. For we which live, Paul said, were always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, for preaching the gospel. Why? In order that the life also of Jesus might be revealed, might appear, might be manifest in our mortal flesh. That's another, uh, that, that's another metaphor for clay jars, <laughs> for plain pots, mortal flesh, our bodies. He says, verse 12, so then death worketh in us, but life in you. Let me tell you something. The only way that that supernatural blindness of the mind of lost people can ever be penetrated is by a greater supernatural light that overcomes that supernatural darkness that Satan puts in the hearts and, and minds of people. New Covenant ministry living is really, as he says in verses 10 through 12, a crucified life that will unleash a resurrection, transfigured life of Jesus. And the only way to effectively reach lost people is through self-sacrifice. As long as you're concerned about your own selfish issues, you will be limited and perhaps even prevented from really reaching people for Jesus. It requires the shattering of these earthly lives, so to speak, in order that Christ might be revealed. You remember when Paul was tracking down those disciples of Jesus before he saw that light on the Damascus road? When that light first blinded him, he said, who are you, Lord? And you know what Jesus answered him? He said, I am Jesus whom you persecuted. Wow. He was persecuting believers, but Jesus said, in doing that, you're persecuting me. And so you understand that these clay jars these fragile clay jars, they have to be battered. They have to be shattered 
through self-sacrifice in order for that light to shine out through them. I don't know how you react to this, but it's true. There was a missionary to the Congo. Her name was Helen Rosevear. She was actually a medical doctor in the Belgian Congo back in the, in the 60s. And she was there during that Marxist Simba rebellion. It was awful times. Missionaries were beheaded uh, and killed. And uh, many Christians, African Christians, lost their lives during that Marxist rebellion. But amid that anguish and amid that agony, one dark night, she was kidnapped by a band of Simba rebels. And she was carted off and she had uh, unimaginable things done to her. One thing that happened to her is that she was raped by these rebel soldiers. And in the anguish and agony of one dark night, she wondered, God, how could you have let this happen to me? You know what she says? She said immediately, she sensed the Lord saying to her, Helen, thank you. Thank you, Helen. Thank you for letting me use you. Thank you for letting me use your body because they did not rape you. They were raping me. And she suffered for Christ. Currently, the Lord has no way to take this world's wrath upon himself except through believers like you and me. And they heap it on him whenever they would heap it on us. But the fact of the matter is his life has to be seen in this world. And it can only be seen through you and me. It can only be seen when our self-life and our self-interest is shattered into pieces. So that Christ that is in you can shine out and radiate through you his life to a world without any veil hiding it. Reminds me of this also. Christ revealed through clay jars. Jars that are shattered by different kinds of affliction, but through that they radiate the glorious transfigured Christ, the resurrection life of Christ to a lost and a dark world. It's in that way the light of Christ is fully exposed it glows without any hindrance, but it doesn't happen automatically. We have an opportunity to choose to depend upon the Lord in our affliction. And I think one of the greatest biblical pictures of what Paul is trying to say here, where these fragile clay jars are shattered so that the treasure that we have in them, which is the light of the transfigured Christ, shines out, is what happened in the book of Judges, under the Judge Gideon. Remember the Midianites were against them? And they, they had 22,000 Midianites. And they were, it, uh, Gideon gathered his soldiers together. And God trimmed down Gideon's troops to 300 men against 22,000 Midianites. 300 men. You remember the plan that God gave? how that these 300 men would completely at night encircle the Midianite camp. And they were to have a lamp. And that lamp was to be in a clay jar. And when Gideon gave the, the, the command, they were to break their clay jars so that the light in them could be seen. And when he gave that command and the clay jars were broken and the light was seen, it, it brought panic and bedlam to the Midianite uh, soldiers in the middle of the night. And they began to kill one another in the bedlam and to flee. And God gave Gideon the victory. This is the whole theme of the book of 2 Corinthians, which I have titled The Strength of Weakness. <laughs> 
It's when these clay jars are broken that the light of Christ shines out. This is what God's doing in your life and mine. If you wonder why, why this affliction, this is what he's trying to accomplish. He doesn't want you to get angry and bitter about your circumstances. He wants rather to let the glorified, transfigured Christ in you to shine unhindered through you. He wants people to see Christ through your fragile, plain pot, clay jar body. And then the second thing that I mentioned, which closes out this passage, verses 13 to 18, the second thing that really is a vital part of new covenant ministry living is not only power that is the result of openness and weakness, but also perspective. Look at what he says in verse 13. He says, we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written. I, he's identifying himself with the psalmist in Psalm 116. And I, I'm not going to take you there, but the 116th Psalm is about a person that is suffering some great affliction. And yet he says, I'm going to believe God. I'm going to trust God in the midst of my affliction. And Paul says, well, that's exactly what I'm going to do. That's exactly what my team is going to do. As we minister, we're simply going to believe God like the psalmist. I believed, the psalmist says, and therefore I have spoken. Well, guess what? I believe, and so I'm going to keep preaching. I'm going to keep speaking. I'm going to keep new, new covenant ministry living is what he's saying. Verse 14, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God. He's saying, here's how you endure in new covenant ministry life. You have to always depend on God. Depend upon God. Depend upon his promised resurrection glory. You're to continue to live and serve God through your affliction simply because of this. You trust him. You can't figure it out. You trust him. Because you know. You know what I just told you. Paul said, you know that this battering, this shattering has to happen because that's how Christ is seen. That's how you reach a lost world. That's how the, that, uh, that blindness is penetrated. That's how the truth shines through. So just trust me, is what he's saying. Keep on continuing because you trust me, because you know that I'm going to use your trials to reveal Christ through you. And when I reveal Christ through you, verse 14, I'm going to draw other people to myself through your life. And when that happens, there's going to be great thanksgiving and glory. There's going to be thanksgiving, not only from you, but from them that are drawn to me through you. And there's going to be great, greater glory because there'll be more people that will be brought to Christ. That's what he's saying here. Look at verse 16. For we which, uh, for which cause we faint not. Same thing that he said in verse one. We don't quit because we're discouraged because of our affliction. We don't quit. In fact, though our outward man perish, the outward man is your clay jar. The outward man is your fragile mortal flesh, your human body. Though your outward man, and by the way, you can protect it as much as you can exercise it. You can eat all the right stuff and, 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 and you can still die young <laughs> because it's mortal flesh. It's been sin infected. And so he says, our mortal flesh is perishing. And you can deny that, but it is. You know, I look in the mirror uh, as uh, at the age I am now, and I see, oh, man, I am living in mortal flesh. <laughs> I can't deny that. But here's the good news. While the outward man is perishing, 
They're going to be, if, if Jesus doesn't come soon, I'm going to be six feet under. Okay. That's, that's, that's reality. If Jesus doesn't come soon, I'm going to be six feet under, but I'll be waiting for a new body with him in heaven. But though the outward man perish, the inward man is renewed day by day. You know what the inward man is? That's the real you. The inward man is the real you. The outward man is all is, is what we think is real, as human body. But this human body is going to go away. And when Jesus comes for us, we're going to get a new human body. But the real you is what lives inside of this human body. And inside of the human body, there is a human spirit that if you are a believer, is indwelt by the very God himself. This transfigured Christ himself. You are a partaker of the divine nature. That's the real you. That's the inward man. The, the inward man is renewed day by day. And that's talking about how God, who indwells your human spirit, wants to permeate and pervade your entire soul into your body. The inward man is renewed day by day. It requires, by the way, the inward man, your soul life, requires a daily spiritual recharge. I don't ever expect to have an EV. Neither do I want one. I don't want to be uh, having to only go 300 miles and I have to plug my vehicle in. But you know, your spiritual life needs a daily recharging. Have you had that yet? Have you plugged in yet? I have this little, I call it a moon lamp that I, I have on my wall, my bedroom, and uh, uh, it's it's battery, but I have to plug it in every once in a while and recharge the battery. I go to hit the hit the remote and it doesn't light up and I realize, okay, I gotta I gotta recharge it. You gotta recharge your spiritual life on a regular basis. If you don't, you won't be here. You know, there's some people that aren't here today because they haven't plugged in. They haven't recharged. There's some, some of you that are here that you're really not here. <laughs> you haven't recharged. You haven't uh, renewed the inner man. You're here in body, but you're not really here spiritually. Because you haven't had that daily recharge. And don't expect to simply get it through preaching. You have a responsibility to gather manna for yourself every day and live off of that spiritual bread of life. You get it by time spent alone with God in his word and in the prayer closet. There is no other way to recharge your inner man than time in the presence of God. And that doesn't mean just uh, ritually reading your Bible and ritually going through a prayer list. It means that you acknowledge and you connect in your spirit with a living God and you realize his presence that's what he's talking about the inward man is renewed day by day and then he says here's perspective I'm talking about a biblical godly view of your life you ready for it our light affliction now I don't know what your affliction is and I don't know how heavy your affliction is compared to my affliction, but that's not the point. It's the wrong comparison. The comparison is this. Our light affliction is but for a moment, and it works for us a, more, a, a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at things which are seen, but at things which are not seen, things which are seen are temporal, things which are not seen are eternal. There's the comparison. That is a godly biblical view of life. And if I can boil it down to this, here's what it means. There is a cross before a crown. There is a suffering, affliction before there is an enjoyment of heaven. And this is critical truth to endure in your life. You want to endure? You don't want to be a dropout? You don't want to quit? You don't want to faint? 
You don't want to be give in to discourage and defeat. You got to get this truth. It's critical to endure. It is the believer's hope. And that is this, that our hope is not temporal. Our hope is eternal. That this life is just a flash in the pan. This life is but a vapor that appears for a short time, then vanishes on the way. But we have an eternity ahead of us. And it's all good in eternity. It's all good, and it's all laid out for us. And that's where Jesus is right now, preparing that place for us, we're told. The Christian's hope is eternal. This present life of limited physical, mental, and emotional affliction. There's all different kinds. I may not have named them all. There's all different kinds of affliction. But it's all limited. This physical, mental, emotional affliction in this life is limited, and it leads to a future of immeasurable glory and total transfiguration of ourselves. That process of transfiguration that 2 Corinthians 3.18 talks about is going to be complete when we see Jesus face to face. You see, folks, it's all about your, your perspective. It's all about your viewpoint. And you and I, as believers, if we're going to endure, we have to be laser focused on the eternal, not the temporal. What are your values? They have to be eternal values. You have to be laser focused on eternal promises and eternal values and not temporary, earthly ones. I don't know if you've ever heard of or read the book, Tortured for Christ. It's the testimony of a Romanian uh, pastor, Richard Wormbrandt. He spent 14 years in prison for preaching the gospel back during the days of Ceausescu, that communist uh, dictator. And although, listen to this, his captors smashed four of his vertebrae and they either cut or burned 18 holes in his body. They couldn't defeat him. He testified, alone in my cell, I was cold, I was hungry, I was in rags. But he said, because of Jesus, I danced every night in my cell. Wow. Ever read the book, Torture for Christ? You ought to read it. He said that uh, during his time, he turned to a fellow prisoner, a man that he had led to the Lord while they were under arrest. And he asked, have you any resentment against me that I brought you to Christ because of what you're suffering now? And the guy's response was, and I quote, I have no words to express my thankfulness that you brought me to the wonderful Savior. I would never have it any other way, unquote. Those two men exemplify to us the supernatural power and perspective that can be experienced by believers who suffer very deep affliction, yet in their dependence on God, experience God as their peace and their joy through it all. Though imprisoned, by faith he burst the bounds of that bonds of that prison and he experienced god's presence right there in that cell making that little cell a bit of heaven on earth you can be locked up with it, you know with four walls and a roof over your head but your spirit can penetrate to the very presence of god and can bring god down into your cell This is what it means to have a tremendous treasure in a plain pot. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be seen to be of God and not of us. It's about him, his power. It's about us having his perspective.